The armed Palestinian group Hamas launched their attack inside Israel on October 7th, 2023, because it was a significant anniversary for them. Exactly 50 years and one day before, Egyptian and Syrian troops launched a surprise invasion into Israel, sparking one of the most significant wars in the eight decades of conflict here between Arabs and Israelis. The fighting broke out during the most important religious holidays of the year for both Jews and Arabs. For the Jews, it was Yom Kippur. A coalition of Arab countries united behind Egypt and Syria. They sent them weapons, soldiers, and even weaponized their oil supply. They will reduce oil production by 5% a month until the Israelis withdraw from occupied territories. But after Hamas's surprise attack in October 2023, none of the Arab states sent their armies in to help. Some countries voiced support. Syria called Hamas's attack an honorable achievement. But others initially condemned them. The UAE called the attack a serious and grave escalation. And some walked a fine line between the two. Egypt asked for exercising maximum restraint, and Saudi Arabia called for an immediate cessation of the escalation. Weeks later, as Israel kills thousands of Palestinians in Gaza, the Arab governments are still divided and on the sidelines. But their people are demanding that they do more to make Israel stop. And it's making these Arab governments nervous. There must be absolutely great concerns that this popular resentment could easily go sideways. So what changed? How did these countries go from being united against Israel for decades to divided today? In 1947, the UN worked with Britain, partitioned this region into two new countries, one for Jews and one for Palestinian Arabs. The Jewish inhabitants accepted the deal and declared their new state of Israel. But when Palestinians rejected the deal and declared war, a coalition of Arab states joined them. Haganah troops search for Arabs after capturing the city. Arab strong points are taken after being blasted to rubble. They were very concerned by the arrival of mainly European Jews. Wael al zayat worked on Middle East policy for 10 years at the U.S. State Department. The Arab world was in the midst of fighting against British and French largely colonialism of the Arab world, the Arab world was like, wait, wait a minute, we, we're getting rid of that European colonialism, but there seems to be another form of it establishing itself here. So they fought the Israelis for several months until both sides signed an armistice, freezing the battle lines. Israel had taken over all this land, leaving just these two territories under Arab control, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. 20 years later, Israel sparked another war and gained even more territory. In response, the Arab leaders, through an organization called the Arab League, made a pact. No peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, and no negotiations with Israel. Until Israel returned land back to the Palestinians. In 1973, Egypt and Syria launched that surprise attack against Israel, starting the Yom Kippur War. But Israel again took over more territory, prompting one Arab leader to break ranks. Egypt's president, Anwar Sadat, met with the leaders of Israel and the U.S. to hash out a peace deal. For Egypt, it was suffering a lot of casualties, was suffering economically. Sadat made a, uh, a calculation that it was in the long-term interest of Egypt to make a peace treaty that ended formal warfare with Israel. Sadat offered to recognize Israel as a legitimate state in exchange for Israel giving back the Sinai Peninsula. He then turned to the Palestinian issue, he got Israel to agree on which countries would be present at future negotiations and outline plans for a future Palestinian government. But he didn't get them to give any land back to the Palestinians. After the U.S. incentivized Egypt with military aid and Israel with oil, they signed the deal, making Egypt the first Arab state to recognize Israel. But since it didn't solve this problem, it was viewed by many Arabs as a betrayal. <laughs> Arab people in Egypt, Palestine, and all over the Middle East protested against this deal. This was Sadat's decision. Whether it was the right decision or not, and his people had no say in that. And Palestinian and Arab governments rejected it. He went forward without his people really being behind him, and he paid the ultimate price. Anwar Sadat, peacemaker of Egypt, killed in a military assassination. While Egypt and Israel's cold peace survived, the rest of the Arab countries continued to refuse to recognize Israel, and the fighting continued. But who did the fighting would change. 
The war in Gaza is by far the biggest story in the world right now, and it's been dominating the news cycles for months because it's so complicated. Navigating all the developments, all the angles, all the voices can be a really daunting task, which is why I'm super excited to announce our sponsor this week is Ground News. Ground News is a website and app that's designed to give people a more transparent and data-driven way to consume the news. Ground News has access to over 50,000 news sources, and they built this site that allows you to compare headlines, view who owns every news source, and where the bias leans in each article. It basically gives you this complete overview of every news source. Let me show you how it works. So last night news broke about a report that revealed that Israel's government knew about Hamas's plan to attack them more than a year before it happened, which is a pretty big deal if it bears out. I can go to Ground News to figure out how the reporting is taking shape. So the first feature is the coverage details feature. This shows me that 142 news outlets is covering this story. That's a lot, so that's pretty good. But also shows me that 43% of these stories are coming from the right. That's a useful thing to know. Now you can trust this because Ground News uses ratings from three independent news moderating sources. So here it shows me who leans right, who leans left, who's on the center, and I can click on one of them and it brings me right to their article on this story. Ground News also rates stories by factuality. So here, it, this shows me what percentage of stories are coming from highly factual outlets. That's stuff like the AP and the BBC and where these stories lie. Ground News also shows you where the ownership of these stories are coming from. So you can see who owns the companies that are breaking this news. Then you can compare headlines. So I can see here's what's coming from the left. Here's how the center is covering the story. And here's how the right is covering the story. I also want to show you Ground News's blind spot feature right here. It shows you which stories are being covered almost exclusively by one end of the spectrum. So if you're on the left, you can see these are the stories that you might not be seeing in your feed. If you're on the right, these are the stories you might not be seeing on your feed either. Ground News also lets you customize your feed right here. And so for an upcoming story, I'm following the Premier League. Ground News has a phone app and a browser plugin, as well as versions for other parts of the world, international, UK, Canada, and Europe. Stay informed on breaking news and get the complete story by going to ground.news slash search party. Clicking that link will get you 40% off the Vantage plan. That's the one I use, which includes unlimited access to all their features for just $5 a month. If you use that link, you're supporting simultaneously two independent news organizations, Search Party, but also Ground News. They're an independent platform trying to make the news more transparent. Thanks again to Ground News, and now let's get back to the episode. So the end of the Seven Nation Economic Summit today was completely overshadowed by an Israeli invasion of Lebanon. In the 1970s and 80s, wars continued to erupt, but the Arab armies largely stayed on the sidelines. The Arab armies uh, came to the realization that they're not in a position to contest with Israel, given its superior military and overwhelming backing by the United States and other European countries. Instead, newly formed militia groups in Palestine and Lebanon did most of the fighting including one group in the Gaza Strip called Hamas, who believed in purely armed resistance to Israel, not diplomacy. Syria and Jordan supported them early on, but a non-Arab country would evolve into their biggest backer. In 1979, Iran's government was toppled by an Islamic regime that loathed Israel and its ally, the United States. We are against Israel, and we will never help Israel. We will cut off our diplomatic relation. Literally overnight, Iran became Israel's newest enemy, and it began funneling money, weapons, and even soldiers to the militias fighting Israel. But just because Iran was a new enemy of Israel, it didn't mean it was a new friend to the Arab states. Iran's new government was Shia Muslim, and saw itself as a rival to the several Arab states that were ruled by Sunnis, especially Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, Israelis and Palestinians achieved a diplomatic breakthrough. In 1993, Israel agreed to recognize a Palestinian government and grant them some authority in Gaza and the West Bank in an agreement called the Oslo Accord. That led Jordan to sign its own treaty with Israel and become the second Arab state to recognize it. But like Egypt's, Jordan's treaty didn't get any Palestinian land back. Jordan's citizens erupted in protest, but its government had the support of most other Arab governments. The world we were in in the early 90s was Oslo, it was peace, it was land for peace. It was negotiations versus armed conflict. So the Jordanian's timing was right for that moment. In the 2000s, Saudi Arabia pushed further by proposing a deal where all members of the Arab League would recognize Israel if Israel withdrew completely from the West Bank, a version of what's known as the two-state solution. But Israel rejected it, and fighting between it and Palestinians continued. 
After trying war, then diplomacy, the Arab states' resolve began to waver right as new conflicts enveloped the region. In 2003, the U.S. toppled the government of Iraq and sparked a civil war. Then in 2011, a wave of popular protests called the Arab Spring threatened many Arab governments and even toppled a few. In 2012, Syria collapsed into the civil war. Then a few years later, so did Yemen. Militia groups emerged all over the region and Iran took advantage of it by funneling more weapons, money, and soldiers to them, creating a network of proxy militias that it used to threaten Israel and increasingly its Arab enemies in the Gulf. As it progressed towards obtaining a nuclear weapon, many Arab states began considering Iran a far greater concern than Israel, despite Israel's increasingly brutal treatment of Palestinians. Israel's government, primarily under Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, was allowing Israeli settlements to expand across the West Bank, and with Egypt enforcing a brutal blockade of the Gaza Strip, which Hamas began to govern in 2006. While this outraged Arab people, many of their governments began considering a solution that had been unthinkable decades earlier, team up with Israel against Iran, even if it meant leaving the Palestinian issue unresolved. For certain Arab countries, when they were confronting both the domestic threat from Arab Spring-esque type of revolutions, as well as external pressures from countries such as Iran. So where did Palestine fall for them? It became the third, fourth, fifth. In 2020, Bahrain, the UAE, Morocco, and Sudan agreed to recognize Israel in exchange for the promise of Israeli cooperation on trade and military deals. The U.S. incentivized them with promises, loans, and weaponry, and they got Israel to pause its expansions in the West Bank, but left the conflict unresolved. That's largely why, in this 2022 poll of Arab citizens, most held a negative view of these deals, called the Abraham Accords. Again, they protested, but their governments ignored them. The, the Arab state's positions first began with an outright rejection of any Israeli entity. Then it became the ceding of land captured in 1967. Then it was acceptance of perhaps some land swaps. Then it became the promise of not building more settlements. Certainly the Palestinian cause became de-minimized. Most of the Arab states that once went to war on the Palestinians' behalf were moving on without them. And in 2022, the most powerful one left, Saudi Arabia, was next. It began negotiating a deal where it would recognize Israel if the U.S. promised it more military protection and gave it nuclear energy technology. They were also demanding the Israelis give something to the Palestinians, but likely not their own state. In September 2023, the deal had become imminent. So you think if you were to characterize it, are you close? Every day we get closer. To Hamas, this deal would make a Palestinian state almost impossible to achieve. So it devised a plan to hurt Israel, rally the Arab people to the Palestinian cause, and put pressure back on these Arab governments. Militants from Hamas launched a surprise attack from the Gaza Strip. More than 1,400 people have been killed since Saturday in retaliatory attacks in the territory. This march firmly expresses our support for the people of Palestine and their courageous resistance. It also represents the Moroccan voice refusing normalization of ties with Israel. This wave of anger from their people has put these Arab governments in a bind because they all really want to keep their relationship with Israel. Egypt and Jordan's governments are acting cautiously because they don't want to be dragged into a conflict against it. Saudi Arabia put its deal with Israel on hold, but didn't call it off. And Bahrain and the UAE have been the most vocal against Hamas's attack because they really like the benefits they get from Israel and the US, and are still worried about the threat from Iran. So these Arab governments are pleading for a permanent ceasefire, and again calling for a two-state solution, but they're resisting calls to cut ties with Israel, for now. Whatever their plans are, whether it is regarding regime protection or genuine advancement of their societies, they need this thing resolved. And so you may see a strong push by them in the aftermath of this war. Because what the Hamas attacks has demonstrated to the Arab countries is that as long as this issue remains unresolved, it can serve as a way to undermine them. So to avoid being in this position again, they need to work towards a real solution, once and for all. 
and that's the last video of the year. I just want to thank all of you for watching. It's been an incredible first six months of Search Party. We've done seven videos. We have over 230 subscribers and over 100 members. So thank you all so much for being here early, for supporting the channel. I'm really excited for 2024 because not only do we have cool stories already in the pipeline, but it's a really big year for sports and geopolitics. Soccer's got a big year. There's the Euros in the summer and there's the Copa America. And of course we have the Olympics in August, which should be a really fun event to cover. In geopolitics, we've got elections happening all over the world, including the US, of course, in November. We'll continue to cover the war in Gaza as well as the war in Ukraine as well. But I'm really excited to bring you some stories about places that we haven't touched on quite yet. And before I wrap up, I just want to thank my team at Search Party. Everything you see here wouldn't be possible without the people I work with every day. My research producers, my editors, my managers, uh, our music composers, our studio managers, and especially Johnny and Iz. I just want to thank you guys for letting me do this. And I'm really excited to keep working next year at Search Party. Thank you all. Have a good year. And we'll see you in January.